Well, hello, everyone. Hello. I hear hellos. We're good with that. Well, I first off want to just say, uh, first and foremost, I'm thankful for everyone being here. And I want to start off by saying I'm sorry to our graduates. I didn't have anything this week. Can we have a graduation service next week? Nobody wants to. It doesn't matter. Okay, we're still going to do it. It doesn't matter. I'll wear my cap and gown. So I'm very sorry for that. That's on me. So uh, anybody who is graduating, if you're listening online uh, or you are here, we would love to see your smiling face uh, next week as we get ready to celebrate that and continue our Men of the Word series uh, that we're going to be kicking off today. So uh, wherever you are, just plan on doing that with us, and we would, uh, we would love to see you here. So now as we dive into our new series, uh, I need some help uh, this morning. If you'll let somebody know, God knows your name. All right, let somebody else know God knows your heart. Now let somebody else know God knows your purpose. Yes, you have, you have now talked to three people. Let's put all three things together, and it is this. God knows your name, God knows your heart, and God knows your purpose. So as we get ready today, I want to say I, I'm pretty sure we're going to bat a thousand on this, but let me ask you this question. How many of us chose what family we were born into? None of us. I'm sorry. That, that happened. So if you want to blame that on anyone, that's no one's fault, right? Yeah, let's be honest with you. Some of us, when we look at our family tree, some of us today probably have a family tree that's, that's probably filled with legacy. Maybe you're a fourth generation or you're a fifth generation. Maybe you've got pride. Your family was uh, deeply rooted in conviction with the Lord. Or maybe you're, uh, you know, you're, you've got a Learjet that you haven't told anyone about and haven't taken anyone on a ride on. I'm sure our graduates would like a ride next week. I'm just saying. If that's you, wherever you are right now. So many of us may know someone that's that way, and it may be our family tree is that way, or maybe, maybe your family tree is not quite as fruitful. Maybe it, it's like me, and you know, it, sometimes it doesn't branch the way it's supposed to. You got some sister cousins and brother uncles. You know what I'm saying. You got those somewhere along the lines. <laughs> pray for me. I need it. So that being said, uh, maybe just maybe your family tree is full of pain. It's full of poverty, regret, and shame. Maybe your family tree is nothing but a stump right now. See, I would say many of us would think, most of us, to be quite honest with you, are in that second family tree when we look at our family tree. And maybe you think you're all alone, but what we're going to learn today uh, from the man of the word we're going to learn from is from Josiah is his name. And what today I want you to know, wherever you are, no matter what your family tree is, I want you to understand this. You can keep trying to define yourself by your family tree and explain your past away, or you can decide today to make a difference for your family's future. You see, I would say all of us have those in our family trees, those branches that may not be as fruitful as we thought, or as I said, don't branch, grandma, aunt, cousin, sister, whatever that is, we are in the South, whatever that looks like, wherever you are with that. But all of us could say today that our family tree is important in our life, but those of us in Christ know that there's a greater family tree that we get to be a part of, and it is God's family tree, right? And that's what we need to dive into. So we're going to talk about this guy named Josiah, wherever you are. If you've got your Bible today, we're going to get to the 14th book of the Bible. I know, very specific. But 2 Chronicles 34 is where we're going to be, 2 Chronicles 34. So if you want to go ahead and get there, we would love for uh, you to go ahead and do that. If you would like a Bible, we have them free over in our garden area. You just go grab that Bible. And when you do that, you can write your name in it, take your notes, you keep that with you. And when you come back next week and we celebrate our graduates, you have that Bible in your hand, and we would love to celebrate with you on that. As always, uh, we can follow along in our Vine Church app. You get that for free at the vine.tv slash app today, and you're going to see a tab that is the notes tab, and you'll also see all the information to, to keep up with us and plan for everything that we have going on here at the Vine. And last but not least, our Vine production team all the time, wherever you're watching throughout the week, are going to make sure the Scripture and anything you need is going to be on the screen wherever you're watching around the world. So give me an amen if you're at Second Chronicles 34. Amen. I hear amen. So we're already there in the house of the Lord, the 14th book of the Bible. And let's set this up just a little bit. So the, the king, God's people is split into two kingdoms. Because, you know, brothers and sisters didn't fight each other or anything like that. We don't know anything like that in the world that we live in, right? There was a northern kingdom of Israel. I mean, we all get along, right? Because we are family. 
No, we're not going to do that today. Uh, the northern kingdom of the ten tribes of Israel, and they've gone into a Syrian captivity, okay? So, ten of the tribes of Israel in the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is Judah. It's made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. By the way, Benjamin, the tribe, we don't know where the tribe of Benjamin is. It's a lost tribe right now, believe it or not. They're setting themselves up to go into Babylonian captivity because they're worshiping whatever god they want to worship. They have idols. I know that's, that's, we don't have like shows named American Idol or anything, and they probably just kicked us off YouTube. But whatever. Uh, we don't have those things in our life. They're worshiping whatever God they want to. And this guy named Josiah is about to take over as king. We're going to see in Second Chronicles 34. But what ends up happening is Josiah has a long lineage. His great-grandfather is Hezekiah. He's known as a great king, a righteous king, got Judah back on track following the Lord. He has a son, which is Josiah's grandfather, and his name is Manasseh. And what ends up happening is Manasseh is a mystic, he's a murderer, he's a sorcerer, he sacrificed his babies to idols. You know, to Moloch. He just, he, he barbecued his children. I mean, it's crazy. And so what ended up happening is he goes away to Assyrian captivity for a moment in his 55-year reign, but he repents. He turns back to the Lord, and when he comes back, he tries to remain the rest of his reign following the Lord. No longer following the Asherah poles or the prophets of Baal. He said, I'm going to make a difference. You know, he, he just, I'm going to make a change. Like he looked in the mirror for once in his life. And so now Israel is gone, but Judah is now back following the Lord and they're wishy-washy. So he has a son. His name is Amon. That's Josiah's father. And he does the evil in the sight of God. He continues in the idolatry that his father, Manasseh, had, had built up in him. And Amon is hated so much by the people, after two years of a reign, he's assassinated. And so because of that, him being assassinated, <coughs> wrong to talk, about, talk amongst yourselves. Um, all right. <clears throat> he's assassinated, and because he's assassinated, uh, now Josiah is about to take over. So now the assassins have been assassinated as well. So the assassins assassinated Amon, and now the assassins have been assassinated as well. And that's where we're going to pick up Josiah. So he's been with his grandfather Manasseh, who has served 55 years, and then Amon has served two years. And this is where we're going to pick up when Josiah picks up his reign. <clears throat> it says this in verse 1 and 2. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and followed the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. See, Josiah is going to show us that we may not be able to choose our family tree. We may not be able to choose our parents, but we can choose to make a difference for our family's future. Think about what he's seen. His grandfather Manasseh, he probably didn't know his grandfather Manasseh as the evil king. Somewhere between five and six, his grandfather Manasseh passes away. And then he sees his dad, all the way up to eight, be assassinated. He's seen a lot. And yet at eight years old, he is now the king. So imagine this. If we went to Von Kins and said, hey, you're the president, I guarantee you our country would be in better shape. But we won't open that one. But if you did that, I mean, for real, let's be real. Um, eight years old, and they see the Lord in him. Let me ask you this. What is, it, what is the kind of faith we're called to have as a what? Childlike faith. So it's no coincidence that an eight-year-old takes up residence as the king of Judah at this moment in time. It should be no surprise to us that that happens. It goes on to say this in verse 3 and 4. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Now it just said in verse 2, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now it says he starts to seek God when he is 16 years old. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high, of high places, Asherah poles, and idols. Under his direction, the altars of Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles and the idols. 
Then he broke to pieces and scattered over the graves those who had sacrificed to him. He went, I mean, he went gangster. He's a guy I would like. Look, he just said, hey, not only are we ridding ourselves of you, we stomp on your grave. Like, he was ready to go. He had dropped it all. He took their bones, ashes to ashes and dust. Anyway, he dropped it on them. So, Josiah, at 16, he starts to follow the Lord. I want you to think about something. I started off by saying his grandfather, Manasseh, was evil at the beginning. And if you read about it in 2 Chronicles 33, you can read about it. You can also read about it in 2 Kings. But it says that they put a hook in his nose and the Assyrians dragged him away. And then he repented. He realized his evil ways. That's why in the New Testament we're called to do what? To sin. We're supposed to flee lest it drag us away, right? Now imagine who planted those seeds of the gospel inside of Josiah. It was Manasseh. How else would he know to follow the Lord? See, he probably told him stories about back in the day when he was evil, and now he's repented and turned into the Lord, right? I mean, come on, y'all. He was singing singing the judge, right? Grandpa, tell me about the good old days. Like, you know it was. Come on. What y'all know about it? Now, some of y'all went to T.I. We'll pray later. It's all right. Unlike T.I., if you see me in the street, you do know me. We good like that, so it's all good. So this is where we see Manasseh pouring in to Josiah. Proverbs, Proverbs 22, 6, right? Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will what? Not depart from it. Manasseh has a choice to make, and he decides to disciple Josiah. At 18, in his 12th year, he is tearing down all the idols that his father set up again. As a matter of fact, when it talks about Amon, when you read about him, it says there were cobwebs on the altar of sacrifice in the temple because it had gone so long since the people had gone in there. How many of those places of worship do we see right now with cobwebs? Yet we meet in a gym every week, praise God, to make room. See, Josiah understands, and I'm sure Manasseh told him, the way of the king is the way of God's people following the king. If you read throughout the Old Testament, if the king did evil, God's people did evil. If the king brought people back to the Lord, the people of God went back to the Lord and followed the ways of the Lord. It's funny how that happens. There's always one leader, right? There was one little duck with a feather on the back, right? He led the others with a... Somebody's paying attention. Praise Jesus' name. So, there's always a leader. And you know what, church? We are the leaders in the world. We are not going out trying to go and change people for ourselves. We're going to share the hope of the gospel with them. We get to be the leaders. That's what Manessa chooses to do. So, listen to this. Just think about about this. Instead of continuing to sow those seeds of God's wrath, because it was coming— Josiah says, as long as there's a breath in me, I'm going to make a difference, and we're going to experience God's righteousness. Do you think that was easy? He tore down everything the people worshipped that wasn't God. I'm sure he probably wasn't liked in the beginning because there was somebody making some money off of it. Let's just be honest. That's what it is. There was somebody getting some, some advertising dollars. And so wherever you are today, I want you to know, And we'll share it even next week as we go and and celebrate our graduates. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're too young to make a difference. An eight-year-old king at 16 and at 24 made a difference. And you know what? Don't ever let anyone convince you you're too old to start. Because I remember Sarah was barren without a child, right? Way past her childbearing years. Her old husband was about as old as Strom Thurmond when he had a kid, right? Abraham, who was an old man. And yet still, they have multiple, they had a child, right? Abraham had more than one, but that's a different story for another day. So I want you to know for all of us, though, that God made each and every one of us for a time such as this. Let's go ahead and go down to verse 8 and see what else Josiah does. So now he started to follow the ways of the Lord, tear down everything that is detestable to the Lord. Verse 8 says this, In the 18th year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the people, he sent Shepham, son of Azalea, or Azalea, however you want to say that, 
and Masia, the ruler of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, look at this, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. Now, this is crazy because there's really not many folks left in the northern kingdom of Israel, and he is going and he is sweeping both Israel and Judah of all the Asherah poles, Israel and Judah of all of the idols, Israel and Judah of anything that takes their mind off of the Lord. And now he's done that. He says, well, now we've done that. If they're left to their own devices and they don't have a place to gather, then they're not going to continue to follow the Lord. So now let's make room and a place for them to gather in church. That's what we do every week, isn't it? We make room. We make a place for everyone to experience the presence of God. And those who don't know the presence of God, maybe even experience it for the first time. Some even trusting him as Lord and Savior. It's what we do each and every week. So for you right now, I want you to think about this. Do you believe God made you for such a time as this? You know exactly. Thank you, John. Yes. Do you know why that matters and why that's declarative and a Holy Spirit thing? I say this up here, and I mean this. We know how the story ends, right? Can we look forward to Jesus' second coming? Yes, but you aren't going to see me on a street corner when I go to Monday Night Raw yelling at people saying that. You know why? Because there's so many people that need the hope of Christ right now, and it breaks my heart. If just one more can know the Lord from my life, then send me through whatever you want to. Don't come back yet, Jesus. Don't come back till you're ready. Don't come back till the Father says it. Nothing wrong with celebrating that. We know how it's going to end, but that's why you don't hear me saying that all the time. I just, there's too many people that don't know the Lord. There's too many people that need the hope of Jesus. Because if the hope of Jesus was in our society, would it be crashing like the walls of Jericho? Anyway, that being said, here we go. Here we go. I want you to know today you were made for a time as this. Josiah is living in that. It wasn't his past mistakes, his family tree, even where he was going to screw up in the future that defined him. Instead, he let the Lord do that. Let's see what happens in verse 12 and 13 today. It says, the workers labored faithfully. We could just leave it at that. What if our country had the workers laboring faithfully, especially those in a certain district? Somewhere up near Maryland and Virginia. Anyway, if the workers labored faithfully, there is no fraud, waste, or abuse. They're going to build the temple. Look at this. Over them to direct them were Jahath and Obadiah, Levites descended from Mary, Merari, and Zechariah and Meshulam descended from Kohath. The Levites, all who were skilled in playing musical instruments, we'll come back to that in a minute, had charge of the laborers and supervised all the workers from job to job. Some of the Levites were secretaries, scribes, and gatekeepers. At the end of verse 12 is what I love. All who were skilled in playing musical instruments. See, now, the, the, they weren't like our Vine worship team who could just build anything. Like, I know they could build anything. I can't. I can't build a Lincoln log. It don't matter. I can't build a Lego set. That just ain't in my blood. I can't do it. But who did God put overseers of everything? The worshipers. Here's what I want you to know today. If you're worried why you can't lead, if you're worried why people aren't following, I want to ask what your worship looks like. Because God always puts his worshipers out front. When the walls of Jericho fell, worshipers. When the Jordan was dried up and they walked up on dry land, worshipers. When armies were befalling them and they were outnumbered, God had the worshipers out front. He always works through his people who worship him, period. Why is that? Because he knows where their heart is. Because what you worship will be seen. A hundred percent. You may not believe it, but if you worship something, if you worship a sports package uh, on TV, that's what you're going to worship. If you worship a season, it'll be there. If you worship money, if you worship cars, if you worship degrees, it's going to be seen. But you see, there is no second. God does not take second place. So he needs his people out front to lead the way. So today, I want you to know, and we say that each and every week, as we go and build the church up and create a space and make room for the Lord, I want you to kind of think about this. I've said this this past few weeks, and I just want to say it again. What have you been arguing about with God because you say you don't have the skill set to do what he's calling you to do? The worshipers didn't necessarily have to know how to build things, and yet they were overseeing the building. And that's something. Maybe you say, I can't do public speaking. I can't do this thing. I can't share my story. 
Holy Spirit lead and just see what happens. I can't ask that person how I'm going to pray for them. They, they don't even believe in who Jesus is. Trust him. Ask them. I can't share that Bible verse. They'll, they'll fire me. If the Holy Spirit calls you to do it, man, oh, man, I'd rather get fired by being obedient to the Lord than keeping something by being disobedient to him, right? See, that's what Josiah is doing. Now, we're going to get down to verse 29 to 31 in a second, but let me kind of fill you in on what happened. So they're repairing the temple and the book of the law. We're going to read about it here. It's called the book of covenant. It's going to come into their hands. And when, I, when they talk about the law, it's, it'll say the law that came down from Moses. So the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, comes into Josiah's hands. And the scribes read to him what it says. And Josiah rips his robe, if you will. I'm not going to do that. I'm not Hulkamania. I'm not that good. But what that symbolized in Israel is sorrow. He realizes the people aren't following God. And he's in such anguish because of it. He knows that they'll never measure up. Some of us are in that second family tree today, and that's probably what you feel like. And I just want to tell you, you're in good company. Because in our own strength, none of us could ever measure up to the Lord. Yet by his grace and mercy, he still did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. So what happens is Josiah goes and he says, well, let's ask somebody who knows what they're doing, who reads instruction manuals. So he goes to Holda, who's a prophet, Tess. That's why I said reads instruction manuals, because as men, we just think that's a, a seat cushion. We don't really read those, right? But somebody who knows the way. And what does she say? She says, all of Judah will go into captivity. But because you have turned your heart to the Lord and led his people back to him, there will be peace in your lifetime. 31 years. Think about that. What if today the, the decision you made, the next step Christ has called you to take and you trusted him to take it, it impacted the next 31 years of your life? Not only that, it impacted an entire nation. How crazy awesome would that be? So now Josiah goes, and he leads the people. Listen to what he does here in verse 29 to 31. It says this, Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites. I love this right here. All the people from least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which is the book of the law, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. Verse 31, then the king stood by his pillar and renewed the covenant and the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and with all his soul and to obey the words of the covenant written in this book. We can see this throughout the Old Testament. This should sound eerily familiar to Ezra reading to the people in the book of Nehemiah when they rebuild the wall. They read the law, and now the people are going to follow the Lord and repent and follow him step by step. There's a moment of rejoicing, and so Josiah goes before the people and says, hey, the way you live in ain't it. Let me show you. It's not about a list of do's and don'ts and what not to do's. It's about the better way, and God's way is the better way because God's way is the only way to life. And so now what we call this, this day and age church is revival. I've shared this before, <clears throat> and I'll continue to share it, and, and, and revival and evangelism kind of go hand in hand, and this is though the difference between them. See, revival, you can have revival and no evangelism, which means you don't have new converts. But here's the thing, you can't have evangelism unless you start with revival, because revival starts in the hearts of God's people. And that's how God always moves. He always starts with his people, and it flows outward. And that's what Josiah is doing. His heart is on the Lord. And because of that now, it affects the entire nation of Israel. It takes all of Israel, or excuse me, Judah, really the nation of Israel at the time because there's none left. But Judah and all of God's people now are turning their hearts back to him. Now, if he could have made excuses about his past— if he got stuck in his family tree, how do you think that would have went? If he made excuses about why he couldn't make a difference, if he said, hey, I just don't have to be as evil as my dad was or as evil as my grandpa, 
maybe, just maybe, I'll be known as a better king. He said, no, I'm not going to make an excuse. Church, I wonder if we took our place in our nation again and didn't make an excuse. I wonder today if we said, hey, since we tried to take God out of everything, it's not going too good, is it? I wonder if we decided to be the right way, to show the better way. Because see, when Josiah does that, we see in verse 32 and 33 what happens. He had everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance with the covenant of God, the God of their ancestors. Josiah removed all the detestable items from all the territory belonging to the Israelites. This means the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And he had all who were present in Israel serve the Lord, their God. As long as he lived, they did not fail to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors. He confesses and repents and leads the way for the people to confess and repent. And I can tell you there were probably worship and rejoicing happening ever after that because people are taking their next steps in the Lord. That's what we would all say we want, right? Eventually, one of our next steps is going to be in heaven. So I don't know about you, it's worth taking next steps to the Lord all the way to heaven as we pilgrim through that. If you were to go earlier in 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, uh, that famous verse we can talk about this church, why I say it's our opportunity. The Lord says this, he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from above, forgive them of their sin, and will heal their land. Isn't that something we would want? Yeah, children and grandchildren, don't you want the land healed? Isn't that something that we're called to do? You see, all of us are products probably of the Baptist boom or something earlier than that. When I grew up, that's what it was. You had to, you build a gym and they would come, right? How many empty gyms are there right now? No, I mean, there's plenty. We get to fill one, praise Jesus' name. It's not empty right now, right? But how many empty gyms are there? Because revival didn't kind of take hold because discipleship was left out. This is why, church, I say it's our opportunity to rise up. Are we just going to sit on that Cracker Barrel porch in that rocking chair of regret thinking about all the what-ifs as society crumbles crumbles around us and say, I got my insurance, I'm good. Are we going to take that step of faith? into our backyard, into our workplace, into our school, and our job, even where we work out. Are we going to take that step of faith or are we going to keep making excuses? Jesus tells those disciples in John 4, 35, the fields are white with harvest, but the laborers are few. Church, we get to be the few. And we should have, I mean, that should excite us. You know why? As Jesus continues to tell them, we're reaping a harvest for the saints gone before us that prayed to see what we see. What we get to see angels in heaven long for. I don't know, that gets me excited. That should get all of us excited. Angels in heaven long for that? I mean, they've seen a lot of me. They've seen me, you know, run out of TP, they've seen me run red lights, they've seen me pray for some things, and they've seen me do some things I need prayer for. Yet at the same time, we get to reap the harvest. Now, I want you to think about this. We've lost this in our time and age when it comes to sowing and reaping. As we're used to just going to the store, and how's that working out? Because <laughs> let me ask you this. Our grandparents could survive without money. They worked a farm. They could provide themselves. We ain't got that. We got to go to the store no matter how hard we try. Could you imagine living without money? You know what our grandparents did? It was called the Great Depression. Like they could, they could live without money because it wasn't there. So this is what I'm trying to get at when it comes to us reaping and sowing. We get to reap a harvest, church, of saints gone before us. And we have a choice. Are we just going to reap a harvest and leave the ground empty? Are we going to do the hard work of tilling the soil and planting the seeds of the gospel for a harvest to come? For people, we aren't going to meet this side of eternity. Because the people that went before us that worked the soil and planted the seeds of the gospel, they weren't, we, we weren't even close to being alive when they did it. So this is our chance. 
If we want to see a difference in our world, are we going to step into that? What I want you to know and be reminded of, God knows your name. God knows your heart. God knows your purpose. See, many of us today will spend our entire life trying to be defined by our family tree. You know, our parents gave us our features, right? We look like this one, that we have the eyes of this one, but creator God gave us a soul. Our parents are just stewards of us, preparing us for all that God created us for. Our family tree might have given us a last name, and it might be something that can make people really proud or shows up on the jail report whenever you look on that on Sundays. But you see, God knew your name before the foundations of the earth. Our family can help us grow and thrive to be all that we were created to be, and we can be discouraged by it. We can be excited by it in each and every season. But God knows your heart. See, the beautiful and scary thing about God is you can't hide anything from God. Just like kids, you can't hide anything from your parents. You think you can, but you can't. You know why they know? Because they made, they, they made you. They did the same thing. They know. You can't hide it from them. The question that I have for you is, are you going to spend your whole life worrying about being defined by your family tree or instead understand the family of God that you are in by faith in God's family tree, just like Josiah did? Because here's the thing, all of us, we're born into a family tree, just like that tree in the garden. What is it God says uh, for the fall right in Genesis 3? He said, hey, you can eat of every tree in the garden but these two. It is a tree of knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And see, the problem is Satan has gone into our culture today, and he's given us just enough of the Scripture, but he's twisted it. He's twisted it. Jesus says in what, John 14, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Right? What if Satan has twisted our culture to say, you can find your way by living your truth that might get you the life that you want? Can you see that? See, when I live in my family tree, that's what I'm trying to do. I want to carry on the legacy of those who have gone before me. And I just want to tell you, that that doesn't mean that, that your heart couldn't be in the right place or you have the right motives, but Jesus came, lived the perfect sinless life we couldn't live, died that death on the cross for us, and rose again, not so that we can leave a legacy, but instead we can be a part of a family for eternity. And so today, you got a choice to make. You can continue to go and try to be in your family tree because, see, the thing is, once again, that tree and the garden, you know what it did? Satan twisted that scripture and it said, surely God will not kill you. And yet when they ate that apple or whatever it is, pomegranate, when they ate that pineapple straight up, just bit right in it, that's probably what happened, just got all kinds of craziness on them. They sinned against God. See, the tree you and I were really born into is the family of sin. Sin. Sin is anything that is against the will of God. Some would say sin is what misses the mark, but anything that is against the will of God. Sin is anything that isn't perfect. And I know I say it a lot because I mean it, but it's true. 99.9% can get you pure stamped on a silver or a gold bar, but it ain't 100. And to be a part of God's family, all of us have to be 100% pure. And instead of God leaving us in the family tree of sin, he said, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to take your family tree, and I'm going to send my son to do for you what you can't do for yourself. He's going to be perfection for you. He's going to live the perfect, sinless life you and I couldn't live. He's going to die the death that we deserve for the penalty of our sins because sin can never, live, can never lead to life. And he's going to love us enough. He's not going to stay dead. He's going to rise again on the third day, and he's going to defeat death, hell, and the grave so that we can live life now. We can live in the purpose that we were created for, the purpose from the foundations of the earth. And the way that he did it is he took our family tree And he made it into a cross. And Jesus bore our sin on that cross for us. The full wrath of God. See, some of us today, we know the Lord, and I pray that you would be encouraged, and today would be the day you decide that I'm going to make a difference. Whatever you're calling me to, Jesus, I'm going to continue to walk in that, and I'm not going to worry about my past trying to explain my family tree. Instead, I'm going to walk in the future that you have for me. Others of us today, you don't know the Lord. You're trying to figure out your legacy. You're trying to figure out your purpose. You're trying to figure out why people don't know your name, and you're missing out on what you were created for, which is to be in the family of God. And the only way to be in the family of God 
is to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and receive this free gift of salvation. Paul writes it this way in Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. He says this, for each and every one of us, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you are justified, and it is with your mouth you profess your faith and are saved. It's both and. You have to believe and receive. And what, you're, what we're about to do as a Vine fam is that. We're about to pray a prayer. It's not the words of this prayer that saves you. It's the faith, the faith that Jesus is who he says he is. And so we pray as a family, as a church, for those who are coming to faith for the first time and are becoming part of God's family tree. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, please repeat these words after me. Dear Jesus, I believe I'm a sinner separated from you. I believe you came, lived the perfect sinless life, I couldn't live, die the death I deserve, paying the penalty for my sins on the cross, but loved me enough not to stay dead, but rose again on the third day so that I may have life. Come take over my life, Lord. Teach me to follow you step by step the rest of my life the best way I know how. With every head bow and every eye closed, if that's you, and for the first time you can say you've taken this step of faith and trusting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have become part of God's family tree. You are no longer your past mistakes or future failures. You're no longer chasing the things of this world, but instead have fully surrendered your life to Christ. On the count of three, if that's you and the first time you've done that, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three. If you're in the house and it's the first time you've done that, if you're watching online and it's the first time you've done that, I'm going to ask you to maybe just leave a raised hand emoji. You can reach out to us at thevine.tv slash respond, or you can shoot us a message wherever you are inside of our app or throughout social media. And for the rest of us, I'm just going to say, I'm gonna, we're going to pray, and then as we stand up in this moment of worship, I, I, I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will maybe stir in you what he's been stirring today is maybe God's called you to a next step and you're struggling to take it. Maybe God's encouraging you to keep going in that next step he's called you to be in. I would pray today that in this moment of worship, we would give him the worship and praise to know that he puts his worshipers out front, and we are saying, just like we read in the Old Testament, here I am, Lord, as Samuel said. Here I am, Lord. Send me. So, dear Jesus, I pray today that you would just be with us in this moment in time. That as we get to encounter your presence and we get to just be with you today, Jesus, we would be reminded not just that you are with us, but all that you have done for us. That when there was no way for us to have our name known by Creator God, to have our heart known by Creator God because of sin, or, or have our purpose known because we were chasing our own way, chasing our own truth, hoping that it would bring life. Instead, you came to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And so today, Jesus, I pray that that's the hope that we would not only be filled with, but we would overflow with and bring it out into the streets this week. And that we, in this moment of time, whatever we're carrying would leave at your feet and wouldn't pick anything else back up unless you called us to. We thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray and for your glory. Amen. Y'all stand and continue to worship with us.
right. Well, thank you for everyone for hanging out with us today. Again, I'm sorry for our graduates. We'll celebrate it next week. We did celebrate a birthday today, though, so I think we can celebrate that, right? Nobody, nobody. It's that way as you all the way through. I'm sorry, man. It happens. It's just a day, right? It's another one, though. I can't believe he's 85 today, y'all. It's great. We can't believe how old he is. He's, 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 he takes good care of himself. He does the, the face regimen every night. So, uh, But we can't wait to see your smiling face next week. We're going to celebrate our graduates, continue our Men of the Word series. Hope you have an awesome week. And always remember, the best is still yet to come.